Hey, Stone Presbyterian Church family. Uh, so glad to be with you today, even though it is through the lens of a camera. But Pastor Dan here, I'm recording at the Orchard Park Wesleyan Church, where I've been serving for the last four years. I have such fond memories and uh, such strong connection with you all at Stone Church and just love you and it's such a privilege to be with you. And it's my privilege to be with you again today. Thanks for inviting me, uh, Pastor Caleb, to share with the congregation this morning. I love this opportunity to connect with you. A couple of call outs this morning. I just wanted to have a call out quick to uh, Jack and Johnny. I'm wearing my cowboy boots just for you guys today. And uh, so I remember you, you all wearing your boots every Sunday and uh, just uh, so enjoyed uh, my time there with you. So happy Mother's Day to all of the moms. Uh, we're so thankful for you and the way that you live into our lives. Uh, and, and the way that your love extends beyond even your biological family to the church family, and we've been blessed, I've been blessed by so many of you. Thank you for your love, and we really do love and appreciate you, and I hope that you have a wonderful time with your family today. Well, let me pray for us before we dive into uh, the sermon this morning. I know we've had some time in prayer together uh, in our Zoom call earlier, but I just want to pray, and that'll help center me as I'm recording, as well as help you to center your heart as we open ourselves to hear God's word. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your love, for your grace. Thank you for this opportunity to dig into your word together and to let your word penetrate our hearts and our lives. And I pray this morning that as we gather around our various listening devices, our televisions, our iPads, our phones, our computers, Lord, that you would Help your word to come to life in each person this morning, that they would hear your Holy Spirit speaking into their lives and be encouraged and challenged to, to really apply your word in our present circumstances, in our families, and in our own personal lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever tried to do something and it just won't work? I mean, like, no matter how, t how many times you try to do it, no matter how many times you, you attempt to maneuver something or whatever, you just can't get it to work. And then someone else comes along and suddenly it just like all goes together. Like, I hate this when we're doing puzzles. Uh, maybe you've been doing a lot of puzzles during this quarantine time. Normally during the winter months is when Karen and I will drag out some puzzles from the closet and I'll be working on them. I, I'll stay up like way too late working on these puzzles and then Karen will come by and she'll just look down at the table and pick up like a simple little piece and pop it right in. And I'm like, what? I've been looking for that piece for 15 minutes, right? And she just sees it and boom, there it is. Maybe you're out there trying to fix something on your computer. You're trying to get something uh, lined up so you can watch the virtual service or whatever it is. And, you know, you've been struggling with this for 20 minutes. Your grandkid comes along and just goes, oh, just do this, do, 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 and like in five seconds, they figured it all out, right? It's like, it, ah, I've been trying so hard with this. Maybe it's a piece of equipment and you just can't get that bolt to line up to go in the hole and someone else comes along and, and it's just like two seconds later, the bolt's in, everything's fixed and you're just, ah, oh, it's gonna be so frustrating. It can even be irritating at times, right? Have you ever felt that way with your spiritual life? Have you ever felt like You've been working so hard and you've been so faithful walking with God and trying to do your best to love others and you're serving in ministry, you're faithful in your attendance at church, but it just seems like God is distant, like you're spiritually stuck. Mark Buchanan uh, describes this reality in his book, Your God is Too Small. Listen to what, or Your God is Too Safe. Listen to what he says. Something somewhere went awry. The zeal fizzled. The fire in my bones became only an ache in the joints. My running became plodding. My lightness became heaviness. My joyfulness became jadedness. I joined the ranks of the murmurers and the fault finders. Those who don't like the music or the sermon or the color of the azaleas behind the church. And I found their number legion. And I got stuck. At first, it wasn't so bad being stuck. I had, from before my conversion, well-practiced habits of cynicism and self-indulgence. This was a territory I knew instinctively and traversed with agility. I didn't have to work at it. Yet I stayed in the church. I continued to lead, to teach, to help, 
to attend. I never renounced my faith. I had times of fresh resolve and redoubled effort, but it wasn't sustained, and I was tired. I was tired of teaching an unruly group of kids who couldn't seem to care less. I was tired of the mere busyness of the church. I was tired of trying and failing. I was tired of not trying. I was tired of being tired. I was tired of being compliant and tired of being defiant. I had chronic spiritual fatigue and I looked around. It seemed like the condition was epidemic. I was stuck and though I was often lonely, I wasn't alone. This morning, maybe some of you are feeling spiritually stuck. Maybe you're feeling like you've been trying so hard in your faith and it just seems like nothing is working, like God is distant. Especially during these times of isolation, we can begin to feel this isolation from God, this this distance that God isn't close, that he's not paying attention to what's going on in our lives. If that's you this morning, I want to speak to you. I want to speak to those of us who may feel stuck. I want to encourage you that you can once more feel the strength of God's presence and the power of his love. I want to invite you to once again gaze on the beauty of our Savior and the glory of our King. I want to challenge you to surrender your stuckness to God to the fire of his holiness, and to let God move you into something new and even unimaginably beautiful in your faith. This is Paul's challenge to us as we approach our passage uh, in Colossians. And our passage this morning comes from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 down through verse 20. I'm reading from the New Living translation. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ, and through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. What a powerful scripture passage that is. And as I look at that passage of scripture, the first thing that I ask myself is, well, who is this son in whose kingdom we dwell? Who is this God? Who is this Christ? Who is this Jesus that we say that we worship and love and believe in. Immediately before this passage, Paul has reminded the Colossians that they have been transformed, or transferred, excuse me, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. An exchange has taken place. They no longer are members of this one group that they used to be members of, and now they have become members of this other group. This other group that they now belong to is headed by Jesus Christ, is led by Christ himself. He is the son in whose kingdom we dwell. The answer is the old Sunday school answer, Jesus Christ. Well, who is Jesus then? And this is what Paul wants to remind us of. He wants to remind us who Jesus is, because if we don't know who Jesus is, we won't know the reality that we are living in under his lordship. And so let's take a look at who Jesus is according to this passage in Colossians chapter 1. And Paul begins by saying that Christ is God. Paul's not talking about some demigod. He's not talking about some prophet. He's not talking about some human king. He's talking about Jesus 
who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, was resurrected on the third day, and who sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. We confess this in the Apostles' Creed, but do we understand the implications of such a confession? Do you understand that when you say you have a relationship with Jesus, you are making a statement about your relationship with God? Like, this is incredible that God, the creator of the universe, wants to be in relationship with you. That, that there's something about that that is un, un, I can't grasp it. It's, it's unintelligible, right? Like, it's, it's amazing to me. But this is the, the Jesus that we believe in. This is the Jesus that we have a relationship. He is God. Christ himself says, the Father and I are one, talking that they have a common essence. Jesus is God. But that's not all that Paul has to say. Paul goes on and says, Christ is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. Now, maybe you have some old pictures of some of your family. It's neat to look at pictures of family members when they're at all at the same age, right? You can look at different generations all at the same age and you begin to see similarities between how people look. I asked Wendy Benedict to send me some pictures of the Benedict family. And so you can see Wendy and Doug there in the larger pictures, but then you can see the boys around Doug and it's incredible to me how similar, especially Chris and Matthew, look to Doug. Now, Tim, I think, looks more like his mom, but, you know, who knows? Maybe he got the better end of the deal. I don't know. <laughs> we'll pick on Tim a little bit here. But just incredible. Like, you can't deny your kids because there's a resemblance there. There's an essence that, that is so similar, right? Like, you, you, you can't say, I don't belong to this person because you're pictured... Uh, betrays you. This is the same way it is with Jesus and God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He shows us God. When you look at Jesus, you are looking at God. The fullness of God was in Christ, verse 19 tells us. This is not a partial view. It's not, it's not a, a, a maybe we get a glimpse of, of God's backside like Moses did back in the Old Testament. It's, it's not, uh, you know, kind of looking at God through a haze and a fog, and we can kind of see some distorted form, but, but we really can't see God. No, we see God himself when we see Jesus. The full view of God is found in looking at Jesus. And because of this, Christ is co-eternal with God. Because we see the full picture of God when we look at Jesus, the attributes of God are also found in Christ. And so Paul tells us in verse 15 that Jesus is co-eternal. He existed before anything was created. And through Christ, all things are created. He is co-eternal with God. He is supreme, therefore, over all of creation, right? Because all things are created through him and sustained by him, he is supreme over creation. He holds all of creation together, and it was all created for him, verse 16 tells us. Now, here's just a, a few numbers to, th to kind of rattle our brains a little bit this morning. Scientists estimate that there are between 3 and 7 times 10 to the 22 stars in the universe. And between 30, or, or that number is between 30 and 70 billion trillion. I don't know how many zeros that is. It's, it's too big for my brain, right? Like we can't really even understand that. You look up at the sky at night on a clear night out in the dark field, and man, you just, it's like amazing. You can't count them, right? But that's actually a relatively small number by some standards. For instance, the number of atoms on the earth, roughly 10 to the 50th power. And the number of atoms in Mount Everest alone is 10 to the 40th power. And the number of atoms in a half kilogram of rocks is roughly 10 to the 25th power. So whether you want to go really big and look at the stars in the universe, or you want to go really teeny tiny small and look at the number of atoms and even parts of atoms, you, you, you see that all of creation, from the 
biggest view to the smallest view is made by Jesus, sustained by Jesus. It's all held together. Whether we go too big to measure or too small to measure, God has designed it. God has created it. God is sustaining it. This is the God whom we worship. This is the God that we love, and his name is Jesus. He is supreme over all creation, and he is reconciling everything back to its originally created purpose for his glory. Every person recognizes that the world is not right, that some things have gone amok. Right? There's no denying suffering and evil in the world. Just turn on the news, right? Like we all have been impacted by this coronavirus. We know that this is not the way that God designed the world. Like we know that this is not how life should be lived. Right? We shouldn't have to stay at home and wear a mask and all these things. None of us want that. And yet that's our reality. And we see that the world is just full of things like this. This is just one example of the reality of the impact of sin and of evil in the world. But Jesus is bigger than the coronavirus. Jesus is bigger than our sin. Jesus is bigger than evil. And he is actively reconciling it all back to its originally created purpose. He does this through his death and through his resurrection and through the Holy Spirit in the people of his church. Jesus is working in your life right now and he is able to bring good out of bad things. Is it all put back to right yet? No, but it is in the process through his body, and it will be completed when he returns. Jesus is so powerful that all forces must submit to him. There is no power on heaven or under the earth or on the earth. No matter where you look, there is no power that is greater than the power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Philippians tells us that every knee will bow and every tongue confess, whether it's spiritual forces in the heavenly realms, whether it's demons and evil things, whether it's just people on earth or creation, it doesn't matter. Every knee, every tongue will surrender, will bow because of the power of Christ. He is reconciling all things back to their originally created purpose. This is the Son in whose kingdom we live. This is the Savior that we believe in. This is the one that we say we love. This is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And sometimes when I think about all that Jesus is, it's too much for my understanding. I have a hard time comprehending the true power and the authority of Jesus Christ. I can't understand why demons shudder and why angels that I would be afraid of worship. I can't fathom the power that raises the dead and heals the sick. I can't handle the authority that speaks truth without apology and love without limit. It's too big for me. And so we tend to make God manageable and safe and practical and small so that we can handle God. I want to ask you this morning, what was the last thing that you prayed for? Was it healing? Was it wisdom? Was it financial help or protection or comfort? Maybe something for your children, your job, maybe for a parking spot at Wegmans? I don't know. When was the last time you read your Bible and you asked the question, who are you, Jesus, instead of what or how does this apply to my life type questions? You see, we want God to answer our prayers and to fix our problems and ensure that our family goes to heaven. And these are all good things. But they're ultimately secondary things. They're ultimately secondary to who God is. When was the last time that you fell on your knees with Isaiah and cried out, Woe is me, for I'm in the presence of a holy God, and I am an unclean man or woman. When was the last time that you were knocked down to your knees with Paul, and you, you were blinded by the dazzling brilliance of, of who God is in your life was turned upside down because of an encounter with the risen Lord? When was the last time that your face glowed like Moses' did after he had been in the presence of the Lord and the radiance of God so it filled his body 
that he literally glowed with the light of God. When was the last time you were just so amazed with God that you couldn't even put it into words? You just sat there with this smile and this glow about you that people were wondering what's going on, but you were just so enraptured by the power and the presence of God that you couldn't do anything else but just sit there and worship and praise of your Savior, Jesus Christ. These experiences, they're so foreign to us because we're content to live in the safe yet frustrating land of a practical God. We want to stay in the kingdom of darkness with a practical God who serves our needs. But I want to tell you this morning, church, that Christ's supremacy, who he is according to the scriptures, directly challenges this kingdom of darkness that we find so comfortable and safe. Jesus will not be your genie. Jesus will not be managed. He will not be coerced. He will not be bribed. He will not be bought with your religious activity. Buchanan, the person I read earlier from his book, says again, a safe God has no power to console us in grief or to shake us from complacency or rescue us from a pit. He just putters in his garden, smiles benignly, waves now and then, and mostly spends a lot of time in his room doing puzzles. Is this the God that you want? It's not the God that I want. I want a God of miracles. I want a God who's bigger than me. I want a God who I can't control, that I can trust my life to, that I can rely on when I've got things going on, when I get stuck, that I know he can come and pull me out and raise me up to a higher plane, to let me stand on a higher ground, to let me live in a life that is fuller and more abundant than what I can do on my own. If I don't want a God that's bigger than me, then why have a God at all? And Jesus is such a God who is bigger than us. He is supreme. He is not a practical God. Remember the friends who brought their crippled brother over to Jesus and ripped up the roof and lowered him down through the roof. I mean, these are just four guys. They need an extra guy for basketball, right? They need a fifth man. They lower Jesus down. And what does Jesus do? He says, your sins are forgiven. They don't want his sins forgiven. They want him healed. And Jesus only heals the man to show that he has the power to forgive sins. But what about those disciples who, when Jesus orders them to throw their net on the other side of the boat, they haul in such a large catch of fish, and then they get to shore, and Jesus doesn't start a fishing ministry with them. He doesn't start a food pantry with them. No, he says, leave the fish and the nets and everything over on the shore. Leave it there to rot and decompose and come, and I will give you a life that's richer and fuller and more meaningful and purpose-led than fishing for fish. What about his close friend? Lazarus. Sick. Jesus could go heal him. No, he lets him die so that God's name would be glorified when he went and resurrected him. What about Paul who prays three times for relief from suffering and Jesus denies each request with words about, my grace is sufficient for you. Is Jesus a practical God? Is Jesus there to just come and to do what we want him to do? No, he is not a practical God. What about the rich man who comes to follow Jesus and brings his resources to the table, all of his wealth, all of his connections, all of his resources there? Jesus, use them. Let's set up some stuff for the poor. Let's, let's set up this ministry over here. We've got connections. I'm able to make political connections and get us into the places where we can actually make a difference. And what does Jesus tell him? Go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And then you can come and follow me. It's not practical. It doesn't make sense, but Jesus is not a practical God. He is a holy God. He is a God who has something bigger and better for us than what we can imagine or conceive of or manage on our own. He is not a practical God, but he is a good God. My friends, if you want to get unstuck in your faith, you have to let go of the practical God and spend time with the good God. A.W. Tozer writes this. He says, we take refuge from God in God. Only a God we fear and yet do not need to be afraid of can make our slow hearts begin to burn. Only this God can dislodge us from the I tried it and it didn't work religion not a practical God that we serve. He is a holy and awesome. He is a powerful 
majestic, supreme over all of creation, God. This is our God. This is your God. Don't try to make him into a practical God, but let him be who he wants to be. And get to know the good God, not the practical God that you keep in a box on your shelf. You might ask me, Pastor Dan, how do we get to know this God? Well, I would say read your Bible. But when you read your Bible, don't go looking for answers to what you should do, but go looking to discover who God is and what is he up to. I would say pray. But don't just go with your list of requests, but go in your prayers and ask God to reveal himself to you in a new and powerful way. I would say serve. But don't just go and and serve in the ways that are recognized and in the ways that have formal positions and titles attached to them, but serve in the less obvious ways where nobody can really see and just watch what God does as his name is glorified and lifted up. You want to get to know this God? I would say worship. Come looking to celebrate God's presence instead of seeking to get something out of church on Sunday. Come simply because you can't wait to to glorify God, to lift him up, to be in his presence together. And when that becomes enough for us, then we'll discover that we take away more than we can carry. That God is so much bigger than our problems. For out of the impractical, out of what seems like a waste, out of what seems like it's not all that worthwhile, comes the answers to our everyday needs. This is what Jesus taught. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus says this. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. And you know what will happen? All those things that we worry about, all those things that we want God to do for us, that practical list of requests, food and clothing and health and safety and finances, they're all taken care of. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things. That's what Jesus has been talking about. All of these other things, these practical needs will be taken care of. But if we come to God asking him only to be a practical God, then you will find God empty. You will find him distant. You will find yourself stuck in religious activity. Because God is not practical, but he is good. And when you come and you discover his goodness and you just enjoy his presence, you will discover that the practical needs that you were so worried about have nothing to worry about anymore. Let me pray. God, this morning, I confess that there are so many times that in my own faith journey, I've tried to make you into a practical God to do the things that I want you to do. Instead of letting you be who you want to be. Instead of just enjoying you and coming and getting to know you, I come asking you to do things for me. Instead of reading your word to discover the the riches of your glory, I I come looking for how-to answers. God, I I ask that you would forgive me for that. And I ask this morning that for this congregation at Stone Church, Lord, that you would help those who are feeling stuck in their faith right now to discover a new power and a new energy and and a new joy in their faith, in their relationship with you as they turn to you, not out of a practical desire, but but just a desire to to know you, to enjoy your presence, to worship you, to recognize that you are who you are, the creator, supreme, beloved Father, Savior. And God, I pray that you would empower them to experience a renewal in their own faith, in in the life of the church. 
in the life of their community as they give themselves to you and then watch as you do through them things that they couldn't even imagine or have dreamt of because you are an amazing and good God. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope this morning that as you go from here, that you go knowing that God loves you. That you go knowing that God is there for you. He's waiting for you to come and to discover his goodness and his grace. And so go in peace, but go hungry to know God. Go hungry to just be in his presence this week. And as you do that, watch him work in wonderful and magnificent ways in your life, church, and community. Go in peace to love and to serve our great and good God this morning. Amen.